How's it going, guys? My name is Zach with The Movie Castle, and today we're going to be taking a look at Scream 2. This is from 1997 and is once again directed by horror icon Wes Craven. Uh, we are also, once again, written by Kevin Williamson, and once again, star Nev Campbell, Courtney Cox, and David Arquette. Really good that they were able to get the gang back together again to make this next movie. And I do really want to stress how important Scream 2, or in general, any Part 2, is to a horror movie becoming a franchise. There's lots of really good movies that have so-so or underperforming sequels, and that's all you that's all you wrote. You know, a good first movie with the bad sequel and no more. But if part two is good, that's the one that says this can be a franchise, this can expand out, and because Scream 2 was good, we're getting all the way up to Scream 6 coming out in just a few days. That's pretty fun. And I do want to say, uh, you look at other movies like, say, Happy Death Day to You or Sinister 2. Yeah, there's a lot nowadays that don't make it past Part 2. But thankfully, we got the whole gang back together and we have a pretty solid entry. Uh, there's more things to talk about, so they don't just retread the whole ground. You know, they still talk about slasher movies, just like they did in the first one, but there's additional things to talk about, like it being a sequel, you know, meta things about, about sequels, and with horror movies, there's a lot to talk about in regards to sequels. Uh, the movie, the first one, in part two got made into a movie, so the events that they just lived through are now Stab, a fictional movie in the Scream universe, and having a movie version of the first one, they can be self-reflective and talk about their own series, which is interesting, but you also get to talk about things like the media, and also, you know, a bit of a deeper meta-humor and true crime, it was a really good idea to have Scream be a movie inside of itself. I, I thought that was pretty fun. Uh, we also get a fun new college campus setting, so that changes things up. And overall, some really good and intense sequences. There's a fun bit with a soundproof room at a recording studio that I always remember and a really absolutely iconic and super tense scene in a car, which I don't want to, to spoil for you, and it does lead to a pretty fun ending there that, uh, that was pretty fun as well, you know? So, um, we also get to see the, the journey and progression of these characters because they did get everybody back, and I do like the points they put everybody in part two, so it's not just a retread, it's something new for all the characters to do and, and take a further step, and I like that as well. Overall, I do want to say that uh, Part 1, I think, is still my favorite, and I think is still the best in the series. The thing with the Scream sequels, though, is they're all at least okay, and I do like how people will have their own opinions and say, oh, I like this one or this one better. I still think it's pretty obvious part one's the best, but I know a lot of people do like that and it's do like uh, part two, and it is a really solid entry. Like I said, if it had failed, Scream wouldn't have been a franchise, and I really am looking forward to the new one coming out. Anyway, without further ado, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the plot. I think this will be the best way to analyze it. Now, I won't be doing any major spoilers. I won't talk about the end. I won't tell you who the killer or killers is. We, we're not going to even say how many there are, uh, but I will have to talk about part one. So if you haven't seen part one, go ahead and pause it here and watch both movies. <laughs> but anyway, no spoilers for part two or future movies. Uh, anyway, we open up with a pretty good opening sequence. The last Scream had a pretty good opening sequence. Pretty good's an understatement. The Scream 1's opening sequence was absolutely classic, 
And here we get a fun reinvention of it. Like I said, the events of part one have been turned into the movie Stab. And we're going to a premiere event where people are going to watch the movie and we actually see a recreation of the opening scene of Scream playing on the, the theater with different people in the roles. And we do cut back to this movie from time to time, but a really clever reinvention, you know, we're talking about the film more directly, what if we, in our opening scene, show the old film's opening scene and we get a bunch of people who are big slasher fans, the studio's giving out free costumes for this special event, so a bunch of people dressed up as Ghostface and you don't know who's real, and any little thing in the movie, the audience is going to cheer, the audience is going to have fun, people in the lobby just running around being crazy. It's a really good, fun premiere event. It's something that movie fans can relate to and really wish we got more of. It's a good, positive reaction. It's a good audience. And I, yeah, it, you know, the fun meta idea combined with just the fun atmosphere of this scene is pretty cool. Now, we do get our couple that we're going to follow into this main scene a guy and a girl, and the girl is uh, an anti-horror fan, you know? I find with some genres, you have people that not just don't like it, but adamantly hate it, and she starts to complain, and yeah, her character is supposed to be annoying, but let's just say the real ghost face will show up, and I don't want to spoil the iconic ending of this scene, but yes, this scene does end in an absolutely iconic way. I really do like how this all plays out. It's a fun opening, you know? And that's the thing. You gotta have a good hook. Scream 1 did, and Scream 2, a clever meta reinvention of it. Got to love the opening. Uh, but anyway, we then cut to Sydney. She's at college, so automatically we are changing the setting there. And we get her character introduction where someone tries to prank call her pretending to be Ghostface, but she has this nifty new piece of technology, Caller ID, and winds up scaring fake Ghostface away. So we get a good sense that she's tough, that the events of part one and with the movie coming up are starting to wear at her, but you know, she's a warrior, she can take it. And she is turning things on their head to these pranksters, which, yeah, it's a good character introduction. Uh, so Sid's there, and she wants to become an actor, which does fit with the Scream tone, because everything here is about movies and stuff. I, I don't know, I always saw her as a, a really tough person, and I would think that she would become like a, a cop or an athlete or something, but I guess actor does fit with the scream tone. So she is getting into acting. She's going to college with uh, with Randy, actually. So good to see him there and him being a film student. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And seeing him in his college class and they're talking about things like they did when they were just high schoolers at a party, but now they're legitimately talking about horror movie sequels in a college classroom, I thought that was pretty fun. But yeah, the news of what happened at the movie theater has traveled to the school, and people are talking about if someone's trying to be a copycat killer, if someone's setting out to not just make their own horror movie, but to make their own sequel, and they start to ask about, well, can you ever really make a sequel as good as the original and they start to debate and Randy says no and they start to think of a few particularly James Cameron-esque ideas of what might be a better sequel talking about aliens is it better than alien and of course uh, Terminator 2 and yeah I gotta say you know aliens and T2 are both really good movies but I have to side with Randy I just I prefer the horror roots of both series originals, so I gotta go with that one, but that's just me personally. Uh, but anyway, 
If you want a really good sequel, though, uh, Amityville 2. Very underrated. I really need to do a review on it. Uh, but anyway, uh, in addition to Randy being there, there are other people that she's befriended at this campus. And, you know, yeah, a lot of Sid's friends in Part 1 wore cannon fodder and didn't make it, and she needs a new group of friends, but these friends do feel real and natural, and plus, you're at college, you get a new group of college friends anyway, and Sid's new group of friends, she has a boyfriend, her roommate, and the roommate's boyfriend, who is actually a Timothy Oliphant, always good to see him, a pretty underrated actor, and I do also like, with the boyfriend character, uh, spoilers for part one, uh, but that's going to be a natural suspect. And I do like the idea of this guy did nothing wrong, but last time it was the boyfriend, you gotta be careful, you know? So poor guy is getting a bunch of suspicion, even though he may or may not have done anything wrong. We, we don't know till the end. Um, so yeah, it's a good group of characters, but eventually uh, the classics will show up. Uh, after the incident at the theater, Dewey will come here. Always great to see him. And it's this nice, really heartwarming scene where Sid runs up and hugs him. And I do like, you know, he doesn't necessarily have the biggest, most personal connection. I do kind of wish, like, his sister died in part one. I wish he would bring up his sister more. But he's just there for Sydney, which was was so sweet. It's like, I heard about what happened and I got on the next plane. I'm, I'm here in case you need me. So that's cool. But what throws the monkey wrench into things is Gail. Gail shows up. She actually wrote the book that became Stab. And they kind of have a rocky relationship. I mean, Sid even punches her in the face, which is pretty funny. And Dewey is mad because in the book she wrote, she describes Dewey as kind of a goofball, and he doesn't like that, even though maybe that is an accurate representation of him. But he uh, he's upset with her. They've broken up. And I do want to say I like this trope being used here, but it's something I don't like in a lot of other movies. In so many other sequels, they do the arbitrary characters break up or the gang splits up and then they have to get back together again in part two and so many times it feels so forced you know the whole plot of the first movie ah uh, them getting together and now it's just the between movie breakup that's a trope that i generally hate but in scream 2 it works it because it's gail and that's part of her character and trying to figure out if she's going to chase the story or if she's going to do what's right. It's, um, yeah, it's part of her character and it's something that's not really addressed with a lot of reporter characters. I mean, how many times has like Lois Lane done stuff like this, but no one questions her because it's Lois Lane, you know? And I do like that Scream does take the time to question it and the antagonism really does feel more warranted here than it does in a lot of other places. And I do like, you know, yeah, she's totally in it for herself, but she's also your friend and she's supposedly not evil, so we can kind of trust her. And in turn, the relationship that Gail has to Dewey and Sydney is a really interesting relationship, the sort of shaky friends. But what she does here a really interesting plot point, in order to get a good story, she brings along Cotton Weary. That's the guy who, in the first movie, Sid accused of killing her mother and got him locked up. And it's sort of this awkward space because, yeah, she sent him to prison when he didn't do anything. Granted, she was tricked, so it's not really her fault, but still, it's like this guy that you unintentionally wronged and took a lot from him. But you also don't really know what he's up to. And I do really like Cotton in this movie. You don't know, is he evil? Is he just trying to make money? Or is he good and just wanting to clear his name and do the right thing? 
and I really do like how you don't 100% know what exactly he's up to. He's a really good suspect in this mystery. But anyway, Ghostface, of course, comes to campus and starts picking people off, and there is a really fun chase sequence through one of the sorority houses. There's really good sequences in this movie. Uh, and of course, he goes after Sid pretty quick. Because one thing about Ghostface, he is brutal and he does try to go after his victims pretty well. Which, you know, a lot of other slashers will wait to the end to pursue the final girl. But no, Ghostface, if he gets a chance, he will go after you. So, you know, you get the police involved, you try to protect yourself, you see what you can do, but there is a good sense of mystery here. Who could it be? It could be anybody. But the thing is, maybe mystery's not the right word. Maybe it's more paranoia, because mystery is more following clues and leading you to the suspect. But in Scream 2, it's any one of your friends, like, say, your boyfriend who didn't do anything wrong, but last time it was the boyfriend, right? Or any one of the reoccurring characters. Could it be me? Could it be you? Any one of our friends. Is it one of our friends? And that's the thing. It's like you don't want to necessarily leave them alone because Ghostface could pick them off, but you don't necessarily want to be alone with them in case they are the killer. So it is an interesting idea how close can we let people get how alone can we let people get and just not knowing who could be the killer at any moment and Ghostface will go after some pretty big targets and and some of them he'll succeed with and, and it's very yeah very gruesome and you gotta love it um I will say I won't spoil how the mystery ends but like I said, it's more about paranoia than the mystery itself. And the reveal isn't as good as it was the first time. I won't spoil who it is, but in, the, in Scream 1, it was such a good gut-wrenching reveal when you find out, again, spoilers for Scream 1, but when it's her boyfriend all along, the first, which I guess I said that already, but um, the, that, when that happened in the first one, that was a big hit. In addition to there being two killers, that was a big surprise. So the ending reveal of Scream 1 was so good and iconic and you really, you know, have to give it to them. As Scream 2, it's an okay reveal and when the killer's revealed, it does lead, lead to a, a fun sequence, you know, a really cool over-the-top ending with some really fun moments but it's not as satisfying as the first one. But that being said, I don't want to downplay it. Like I said earlier, there's some really cool sequences in here and you really do feel the danger and just how big the campus can be. So yeah, fun sequences, reacting to the first through the movie within the movie, talking about sequels. I mean, there's lots of good ideas and overall, and not just in the meta way, but also as just a slasher movie itself, it works really, really well. And yeah, I definitely do have to recommend it. It's just not as fresh as the first time, because the first time it was so new and unique and inventive and naturally doing something again, we do retread a little bit. They do find a bit of a different path where it does feel like the same conversations, but new topics. And yeah, the overall story just isn't quite as good as the first one, but I still really like it. I still think it was very solid. And Scream 2 being good is why Scream 6 is is coming out soon. So I'm definitely going to try to uh, re-watch a few more of these. Hopefully I can get a few more out uh, before my review of the movie. I really cannot wait to see Scream 6 and I'm doing my best to go in as blind as possible and I really really hope it's good so fingers crossed I, I, I saw the trailer it looks pretty fun anyway to everyone who's watched so far thank you for watching to everyone who's liked and subscribed thank you you really are helping the channel out I'll leave a relevant playlist on the bottom this should be my Wes Craven playlist where you can see my review for the uh, the first Scream movie in addition to that, I've covered both of the Hills Have Eyes movies, 
chiller, and I even did a complete physical media collection. Anyway, have a good day. I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Wes Craven playlist on the bottom. Have a good day now.